basically to, what I want to do today is look at the sort of common dragonfly species that you're likely to find in these at this area, sort of Lancashire and Cheshire, which is the area I know best. The good thing about dragonflies is you don't need any specialist equipment to study them. A good pair of binoculars and a camera will suffice. You don't need to sort of catch them and stick them under a microscope, which is always a good thing. And generally, you're only dealing with at most perhaps a couple of dozen species a year in both in both parts of the world. So the aim of today is to give you an introduction to the sort of adult dragonflies, their identification, a bit about where to find them, when to look, where to look. And then, as Gary said, is a bit of a full quiz at the end to make sure you've been paying attention. So what are the features of adult Odonata? Odonata being the posh word for damselflies and dragonflies. Damselflies are the sort of small dainty ones. With sort of, they're not very good flyers. These are generally sort of just the brief sorties, although some can be some a bit more adventurous. The main feature is that compared with dragonflies, when they're at rest, they generally hold their, their wings together parallel a lot of the bodies of their body. Whereas a resting dragonfly generally has its wings out at a right angle or even slightly forward of the head of the animal. The damselfly, the bottom hind wings are almost identical in shape, although they sort of maybe slightly different sizes. Whereas in the dra dragonfly, the front and hind wings are generally different in size and shape. And if you look at the front end of a dragon damselfly, you'll see the eyes are separated on the head. Whereas in most dragonflies, the eyes actually touch in most species. Basically, this is all to do with the way these things hunt. They all feed entirely on live insect prey. Whereas dam damselflies tend to take prey which is on perched on vegetation or on the ground. So they have sort of a binocular vision. Dragonflies tend to take their prey on the wing. They sort of, so they have a sort of different, different sight, sight mechanism. Virtually about 80% of a dragonfly's head and brain is taken up by its visual cortex. Compared with most insects, dragonfly structure is quite straightforward. There's the usual head, thorax and abdomen. Most of the features you'll get you'll hear mentioned in this of in this talk and in the textbooks and in at field guides. You'll hear mention of antihumeral stripes, which are these things here on the side of the abdomen. Oops, sorry. They vary in colour on different species, so that can be a quite useful identification feature. Just behind the head, there's something round about here, there's something that's not mentioned on this diagram called a pronotum, which is a small structure which is can be useful in identifying certain damselfly species. The sort of shape and colour of it can be quite a good feature. On the wing, you'll also hear mention of these spots, the pterostigma as they're called and the costa, which is a vein at the front of the wing. The colour of that can vary in certain species, so can, again, can be a useful identification feature. The abdomen is divided into 10 segments. Segment one, just be aware, is very narrow, so you, it's hardly visible. So the first large segment in the abdomen is segment two, or S2, as it's generally referred to. This is quite important in a number of damselfly species in particular, because the markings on here can help you differentiate the various species. And you also mention of S9 and S10, the markings on here are useful for separating certain dragonfly species as well. So we'll go about, look at that as we go along. So if you to identify the various species you're looking for, so you're looking at in damselflies, looking at eye colour, presence of stripes on top and sides of the thorax and as I, say, as I say the shape of the pronotum and markings on top of the abdomen especially I say segments two eight and ten and sometimes the colour and shape of the wings is diagnostic as is the colour of the legs in certain species. Dragonflies can be a bit more difficult but some of the, the eye colour and the, the colour of the fronds or face can be useful in certain species and the stripes on the abdomen and the thorax and abdomen are often sort of diagnostic and, they, and also you're looking at colour of base and wings of the shape of wing spots in certain species. So once you've got your eye in you should be able to sort of identify most of the common species but just be aware you'll come across something called the tenoral stage. 
Dragonflies and damselflies spend most of the immature stages in the bottom of a pond or a canal or whatever. Then they'll climb up a bit of backside vegetation and the, adult, and the adults will emerge from the larval, larval stage. At this stage, they actually is referred to as a tenoral, basically because it doesn't have any obvious markings. The wings are very soft with a reduced patterning. And basically they're just a dull looking in, in, insect. You can actually identify some of them because you can just somehow make some of the features out. You can also identify some by size and shape and time of year. But generally, if you're not sure, just ignore it. They'll stay in this stage for about a week, during which time they'll feed up and they become sexually mature and acquire their adult coloration. But they're pretty weak flyers at this stage as well, so they oft often they'll sort of fall prey to insectivorous birds, and they can be sort of very prone to be blown away, blown sort of far away from the emergent site. So they can sort of that's one of the ways you get dispersed when to, to occupy new uh, new sites and new habitats. So we'll have a look at some of the sort of common damselflies to start with. The banded demoiselle is one of our largest species. It's mainly found on sort of slow, slow flowing streams and rivers with usually a deep muddy sediment. Although having said that, you will find these, especially at this time of year, straying away from the breeding sites. I've actually had these along the River Mersey at Hale, which is miles away from any suitable breeding colony. And so they can turn up almost anywhere. The main sites in Cheshire I found are the, sort of the River Gowie, going through the Gowie Meadows Nature Reserve, the Cheshire Wildlife Trust, and various parts of the River Alt and the and Curden Valley Park have got sites in Lancashire. We're on the wing sort of mid-May to early August, so we are quite plentiful out there at the moment. The male is pretty un unmistakable. It's a sort of translucent blue black metallic blue insect with this blue black iridescent spot halfway along the wings. It's been found that the size of this spot actually varies with the sort of time the dragonfly emerges. So the dragonfly with a sort of smaller spot has emerged earlier in the year. The larger the spot the later on in the emergence. The female is got all these is a translucent green iridescent wings with a sort of metallic green body with a bronze tip to the end of the abdomen. As far as other species are concerned, these are probably unique and the only ones you're likely to see in this part of the world, so they are pretty unmistakable. You might occasionally come across something called the beautiful demoiselle, which is not found in our, in our regular species in Cheshire or Lancashire. The female of that has sort of more or less more browny green coloured wings with an obvious white spot, but that's not one you're sort of likely to see very often in this part of the region. The emerald damselfly is one of these locally common species. It prefers standing water with luxurious vegetation, but it can stand a wide sort of range of water quality from acid through to brackish. It's mainly sort of a late emerging species. It's usually on the wing from late June to early September, so you won't find it out there at the moment. One way to tell an emerald damselfly, apart from the colour as it at rest it tends to have its wings at an angle to the body about 30 degrees although occasionally obviously will sort of have its wings parallel well that's a, usually an a typical feature of this species there are four species of emerald damselfly in the UK but fortunately we only get one in this region so there's no, no actually confusion species you'd like to come across as its name suggests it's mainly an emerald green Insect with the male has this sort of powder blue colour at the end of the, ab the end of the abdomen and the side on the side of the thorax and nice bright blue eyes. Whereas the female is slightly sort of lacks the blue colour, it's slightly darker and has these these two obviously round spots on the segments, but that's not always visible. And the eyes are obviously different colours, they're sort of brownish colour. So they're I say they're the easiest, probably the easiest ones to come across. Likewise, the red, large red damselfly, that's the only 
red damsel flag likely to come across in this part of the world. It's usually the first one to emerge each year. It's usually on the wing from mid-April if the weather's decent. It's found in most wetland habitats, it tends, although it tends to avoid sort of fast flowing rivers and streams. It's, it's found throughout the UK, although its distribution is quite patchy. There are large areas of arable, arable and upland areas where this species doesn't exist. The male's pretty unmistakable. It's got a deep red abdomen with sort of black bands towards the tip and a bronze black top on the thorax with a yellow stripe along the side. The female, like a few damselfly species, exists in three colour forms. This is the common issue you're likely to see. You see, it's very similar to the male, but it has these sort of black and yellow markings along the abdomen and more extensive black towards the tip. There's a, certain, there's a colour form which is almost all black and there's a colour form which is slightly more reddish and looks more like the male, has a lot le less intensive black towards the tip of the abdomen. But as I say, there's no other red damselfly you're likely to find in this part of the world, so that's one of the easiest ones to identify. Now the azure damselfly is one of two very common blue damselflies we get hereabouts. It's found in a variety of habitats, even garden ponds. It's quite happy to sort of breed in small wetland areas. It's common and widespread throughout England and Wales, and it's on the wing sort of late April, early May onwards. There are two species of blue, dam blue damselfly, which are very common in this region. So it's, you need to sort of check these out pretty carefully to sort of to distinguish the two. The main feature you're looking at on this species is on the second segment. You see it's got a sort of like a U shape marking on there. And that's characteristic of this species. And if you look at the very tip of the abdomen on, of the abdomen on S10, it has a sort of bow tie shaped marking. On the female, it's sort of more, more or less sort of green and black. You also notice if, if you look on the thorax, this la, that small line going sort of pointing forward. This is what we've referred to as a synagrian spur. It's only present in damselflies of this, gen this genus, although there are one or two which have similar markings. So this is a useful feature. It does show up quite well, and it can be very useful to distinguish between the other blue damselfly you're likely to come across. Just be aware that if you're anywhere near Hatchmere in the middle of Cheshire, there's something called a variable damselfly, which also has a sort of U-shaped marking on the thorax, on the abdomen, sorry, but that has a stalk to it, just about right from there to there. And also the shape of the pronotum is different and as is the tip of the abdomen. That's the only site as I'm aware that it, that species occurs, so it's not been recorded anywhere else as far as I'm aware. So the other widespread damselfly, blue damselfly, is the common blue. This tends, again, tends to turn up in a wide variety of waters, but tends not to, have, to, to breed in small ponds or sort of small ditches. And unlike the azure damselfly, which tends to sort of stick to the edges and vegetation of, some, of the water body, this is, you know, can be seen flying quite out over open water. So there's like slightly behavioural differences as well. Again, it's built on the wing May through September, and it's probably the most widely distributed of all the British damselflies. If you look at the sort of markings again, look on this, the se second segment, it has a sort of like a ball shape with a stalk. That's a sort of obvious feature to look at. And if you look at the thorax on this species, it's got very broad blue stripes. They're also sort of characteristic. And there's no obvious sign like here on the thorax of the Synagrian spur, which we had on the azure. There are several colour forms of the female, but most of them are sort of dull green with sort of black top of the abdomen. The markings actually look as it says, quite rocket shaped from above. So hopefully, you know, if you bit if you get a bit of practice, you can actually learn to distinguish them between the two. But that's where a decent pair of binoculars does come in useful. You can probably net them if you like them try them that way, but I always worry about doing damage to these things. 
The blue-tailed damselfly is another widespread species. It's quite tolerant of all kinds of water, water quality. So it can tolerate brackish conditions and water that's highly eutrophic. So it's very common throughout the UK from sort of late May, sorry, early May through to August. As its name suggests, it does have a blue tail on segment eight. The feet of the male has sort of blue, blue and black markings on the thorax and have blue eyes, whereas the female has sort of brownish eyes. And the female actually occurs in five different colour forms, just to confuse things. And it's mainly different, different according to the colour of stripes on the thorax. Some are sort of bluish, some are lilac, these green and pink, these green, orange and pink forms. Most of them have the sort of blue tip to the tail, although some, in some forms it's actually brown. But I say these, there is a sort of small, scarce blue tail damselfly has occurred in the region in recent years. Well, that's only found at a private site in East Cheshire. So I won't need to worry about that for the time being. There's also another recent colonist to the county which has got a blue tail, and that's the red-eyed damselfly. That sort of started to appear about five, six years ago, and it sort of has become quite a lot, quite more, a lot more widespread since then. It favours slow-flowing waters in large ponds and gravel pits, that kind of area. And you'll often see it perched on things like leaves of lilies. It likes to sort of sit on floating vegetation and sort of wait for prey to catch, to sort of fly past. As its name suggests, the male does have very bright red eyes. The top of the thorax is sort of bronze black with blue sides and the tip of the tail is also blue. Other than that it's sort of, sort of the, the rest of the abdomen's black. The female is sort of a more greenish colour and it's sort of has the eyes are a more brownish red. But you, you'll note as well on this, there's that sort of line on the thorax, which looks like the Sinagrin spur on the other species. That's typical of this, the, the red-eyed damselfly. We also have recently this small red-eyed damselfly has colonised several park sites in Cheshire and Lancashire. As well as the site being slightly smaller, it tends to have more extensive blue at the tip of the abdomen. And when it's at rest, the tip of the abdomen is actually pointed slightly upwards. So that's the feature to look out for for that one. As I say, it's only in a certain number of sites, but obviously these, like a lot of dragonflies, it, it seems, does seem to be expanding its range in recent years. Now the hairy dragonfly is one of the hawkers, which are the large dragonflies, which tend to sort of spend most of the time on the wing, sort of, the very territorial, the male patrol, in particular, patrol a large section of water, of a water body, and sort of chase off any intruders and mate with any females that sort of turn up. This is mainly a southern species. It's found in sort of mid to south Cheshire. As far as I'm aware, it's only been recorded once in Lancashire. There has a record actually of this species in the last few days, which, as far as I'm aware, is a sort of first for the county. It's the earliest flying of the hawker dragonflies. It's on the wing sort of early May to June. So, it's, so if you see a large dragonfly at this time of year, then it will be the hairy dragonfly. All the other hawkers don't emerge till late June onwards. The hairy bit refers to the thorax. It has both sexes. The thorax has sort of a covering of small hairs. It's quite small for a hawker dragonfly. It's less than sort of two and a half inches, six centimeters long. Typically of these type of insect, the abdomen, the abdominal segments have these pairs, it's pairs of spots of various forms. In this species, the male, it looks sort of like inverted triangles. They're sort of blue on a blackish background. Whereas the female sort of tends to be dark brown with sort of yellow markings and the abdomen on this species is quite hairy. You also know that a good way of identifying a hawker dragonfly is that generally when they're at rest they sort of hang vertically. This one's not quite behaving itself but this is typical of a 
hawk or dragonfly at rest and they do sort of unfortunately blend into the background really well and they're not particularly easy to photograph either in my experience they sort of tend to sort of be on the wing most of the time so if you if you do see a dragonfly one of these dragonflies goes going to sort of the vegetation you need to be concentrated as to where it lands if you want to sort of follow it and work out what it is The common hawker is one of the sort of larger of the hawker species. It's also it's also the sort of less common of the of the those found in this area, basically because it's preference for acidic standing water. So you might find it mainly in the mossland areas around sort of Bolton, Wigan, and the Heath, some of the Heathland areas in Cheshire. So its distribution is sort of relatively local. It's on the wing sort of late June and it'll sort of fly, you know, the flight period will last until September if the weather permitting. A lot of these, the hawk and dragonflies as well, will actually stray from the water bodies to feed. You'll often find these flying up and down woodland paths or woodland clearings and certain ones will sort of fly at high, quite high up in the canopy to feed as well. The main features on the male of this species the sort of white yellow antihumeral stripes and the paired blue spots along the abdomen. You'll also note that the abdomen is slightly wasted round about here, which is typically which is only unique to this the male of this species. You'll also note this as a sort of orange yellowy colour on the front of the wings, which is quite prominent as well when the dragonflies at rest. These don't all this is the only hawker dragonfly which has that has that feature. You also know the typical large head of these species. With the females, like most of them, is less brightly coloured. This is a brown insect with usually sort of paired yellow spots, and the antihumeral stripes on the thorax are either usually quite faint or often absent in this species. And also, the abdomen in this one is not as wasted as as the male is. The migrant hawker as its name suggests, is it was a migratory insect. It was a regular visitor from the continent to the south coast. And in 1990 or mid-1990s, they started to be sort of appear in the north of England, sort of in Lancashire, boat in Cheshire. And it's since colonised a lot of lakes, ponds and gravel pits in this area. And it's now probably one of the most common hawker species you're likely to see, especially late summer. It's a pretty small species. It's sort of similar in size to the hairy dragonfly, but you can't mistake the two because the flight periods don't overlap. This appears usually sort of early to mid-August and can be on the wing throughout October into November, if the weather permits. And unlike the other hawker dragonflies, this one is quite approachable. You can get sort of close to it when it's at rest. The main feature you're looking for on this species, on male and female, is on segment two, there's this inverted triangle marking. That's typical of this species. So that's one of the characteristics you're looking, you're looking for. Otherwise, the male is sort of a, has dark paired blue spots along the abdomen and blue eyes. As a female has a brown abdomen with smaller yellow spots and green brown eyes. I say it's quite obviously smaller than the sort of other hawker dragonflies you like to find at the same time. So it's relatively easy to sort of distinguish this species. The hawk, southern hawker is probably the commonest of the hawker dragonflies in this area. It's, it is expanding its range. It's recently sort of spread into southern Scotland. So it's now quite a common, like, common hawker species. It's found in a variety of well vegetated standing waters and it's probably the only hawker dragonfly that you're likely to see in, in your garden pond. It's quite happy to sort of lay its eggs in small water bodies. It's on the wing from sort of late June, early July onwards into September and like the common hawker it's often found away from water. You'll often see this flying up and down woodland rides in woodland clearings and it's quite an inquisitive insect. If you sort of stand still long enough, it'll come quite close to see what you're up to. 
It's very similar in marks, marking to the common hawker, although you'll note on the last two segments, rather than having paired spots, they have, they have complete bands across. And the, the markings on the male on, on the first eight segments are sort of apple green in colour and pale, and then it's pale blue on the last three. With blue, and they've got blue eyes. And you'll also note on the thorax, they have these lar two large yellow spots, which are characteristic of this species. And there are two large, obvious yellow stripes on the side of the thorax. This is the, f the female's more sort of brownish colour with green markings and green brown eyes. They don't have the sort of yellow costa like the common hawker does. And obviously, and they, obviously there's a sort of habitat difference as well. These are more widespread and sort of found in sort of more of a wider variety of habitats. The brown hawker is another large species of dragonfly found in a range of slow flowing or standard water bodies. And it's probably the commonest hawker dragonfly in lowland Britain, although it's absent from some parts of the west and southwest. Like the other hawkers, it's on the wings sort of early July to September, and it's regularly seen sort of flying away from, away from water. And you quite, quite often see this late in the evening flying high amongst, amongst a tree canopy. It's an unmistakable dragonfly, given that the wings have got this sort of brownish tinge to them. Um, both male and female have that, and it does show up in, all, in virtually any time you're likely to see it. Other than that, it's a sort of brownish dragonfly with sort of two yellow stripes on the thorax and small blue or yellow spots along the side. So there's not that much difference between male and female. The, only, the eye colour is sort of slightly different, but that's about all. The emperor dragonfly is our largest species. It's sort of found in a variety of well-vegetated ponds, lakes, canals. Going back 30 years when I started sort of watching dragonflies, you could only find the emperor dragonfly on the second coast. Since then, it's sort of increased quite dramatically throughout this region, and it's found on most lakes and large ponds and stretches of canal. It seems to spend most of its time patrolling up and down its territory along sort of an area, along, along sort of an area of canal or small sort of pond or whatever. It's the lot earliest of the large hawkers to emerge. It's on the wing sort of early June, but it's usually, flight periods usually finished by the end of August. It's pretty unmistakable. It's both sexes have this apple green coloured thorax with no obvious markings to it. Then the, the male has this sort of bright turquoise abdomen with a sort of dark line down the top, whereas the female is sort of dull green. So the, the size and the sort of behaviour is pretty characteristic of this species. The small spot, small, small spotted chaser is a medium sized dragonfly. It's common throughout most of Britain and Ireland. It's usually the first one to emerge in the spring, usually sort of early May onwards. It's typical of the sort of chaser and skimmer dragonflies. If you look at the sort of thorax on these things, it's rather than being cylindrical, it's sort of flattened out laterally. So that's a good characteristic to look at. To look at. It's one of the few dragonflies where the male and female virtually look the same. So both have this sort of brown eyes, thorax and abdomen, which go to this sort of black tip. And you'll also find, if you look at it laterally, there's sort of several white, several yellow spots along the side of the abdomen round about here. But the main thing to look for on this are these spots on the halfway along the front of the wing. And this is one characteristic of this species, which obviously gives it, gives it its name. And also you'll find the yellow base to the, to the wings as well is quite characteristic. You shouldn't really sort of confuse this with any other dragonfly if you get a decent view of it. Although the female does look quite similar to the raw bodied chaser. Which is another sort of medium sized dragonfly. 
it's widespread throughout much of England and Wales and usually found on sort of small water such as ponds, small lakes and ditches. It's one of the, it's a dragonfly you quite often find colonising uh, newly created wetland areas. You know, you could dig a pond and a few days later this species, species will, will appear and quite happily colonise, you know, an area which, before it's established. It's on the wing mid-May to, to late July, so it's quite active about now. It's quite a distinctive dragonfly. The main thing you notice, it's got brown head, brown thorax, and these obviously black brown bases to the wings, which sort of stand out quite quite well. There's also these sort of couple of pale stripes on the abdomen and then on the thorax, and then on the abdomen on the male is powder blue and on female it's sort of an ochre colour with some yellow spots along the edge. I say it's one that's on the wing quite at the moment so it's quite sort of one you know, quite abundant in most of this area. Black-tailed skimmer is another species which has sort of increased its range dramatically in the last few years. It's one that takes advantage of sort of newly created man-made habitat such as gravel and clay, pit, clay pits, that sort of area. And unlike sort of a lot of dragonflies, it will regularly perch on the ground. You'll often see some sort of bare earth or bare mud at the edge of a sort of water body. It's on the wing sort of late May, early June into July. And it's doing quite well. It's in fact in certain areas it's the most dominant dragonfly on certain you know, in some sites. I think in Rickson clay pits is a particular good place for it. The male is a sort of a powder blue, has a powder blue abdomen with the black tip, and greenish blue eyes, whereas the female is sort of a yellow brown sort of insect with this, you'll notice sort of these two dark lines down the side of the abdomen and with cross lines of cross skin, sort of a ladder pattern to it. So the only other species you're likely to sort of mistake this for is something called a keeled skimmer, but that's a, a irregular visitor to the, this area. You won't sort of come across that, and that doesn't have the sort of black tip to the abdomen. The darters are a group of sort of small dragonflies. They're quite two, two of the species are quite widespread. The black darter is our smallest species. It's mainly found in acidic pools on heathland and moorland. It's a place like the sort of Lancashire mosslands, the areas around Greater Manchester is the best place to see it. It usually emerges late June, early July, so it's sort of quite late in the year. It's typical of a darter dragonfly in that it's got a long, narrow pointed abdomen, which is cylindrical rather than being laterally flattened. The male is sort of black with sort of yellow markings along the sides of the abdomen and it's sort of this sort of distinct waist round up to the midpoint. The, the female is when it's mature has a sort of yellow abdomen with black markings down the side and this, if you look at the top you can't really tell on this but if you get a decent view there's an inverted t-shape on the on the sort of last the sort of segments eight and nine of the abdomen and you also you'll also note these sort of broad markings on the outsides of the abdomen which is characteristic of this species but it's a very small dragonfly you're not likely to sort of mistake it for any other the common data as its name suggests is one of our commonest dragonflies it's found throughout the uk from sort of mid-june onwards it'll fly through October into November, if the weather's suitable. And it's often found away from water bodies. So it'll visit any, it'll visit your garden. It'll sort of turn up in woodlands almost anywhere. And like the black tailed skimmer, it does actually quite happily perch on the ground. You'll often see it on bare earth, concrete, wooden bridges, that kind of thing. Basically, it means it can fly in cooler conditions than a lot of the other dragonflies. Even. It's one of two small reddish coloured dragonflies we get. In this species, the abdomen is sort of an orangey red colour, with a, and the side of the thorax has got these two yellow stripes with a orange red panel in between. 
it's a slight waste, but it's not very really obvious. And both both male and female have sort of brown legs with a yellowish stripe down the middle, which is quite distinctive. And there are small areas of yellow at the base of the wing. The female is sort of an the female has an ochre coloured abdomen. The other, the other red darter species is the ruddy darter, which is slightly smaller than the common and less sort of less abundant. It's pretty local in certain areas of England and Wales. It prefers large areas of well vegetated ponds, often with woodland nearby, although it can tolerate a you know, decent sort of range of water conditions. Again, it's a late emerging species, so early, early July to late August is its flight period normally. So it's, as its name suggests, it is a, mainly a red dragonfly, particularly the male. It's, the, the abdomen of a male is sort of a blood red colour, which is really obvious, with two dark markings towards the tip. And it's a slightly wasted round about segments three to four, which is quite obvious if you see it from above. Both species have both sexes have black, all black legs. They don't have the white, the pale stripe as the common data. The female is sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, yellow ochre colour with black markings down the side. And if you look on the sort of thorax here, you'll see there's a sort of T-shaped marking, which is characteristic of this species. So you, you will find this in the same habitat as the common data. So if you Get to know these features, you should be able to sort of distinguish between the two. So there's a sort of species you're likely to encounter when you're out and about through your average year in this part of the world. There's still useful books out there, obviously, because dragonflies are a popular group of insects. These are the main ones which cover just the British species. You can obviously there are certain ones which will cover Britain and Europe as well but if you're starting out these are the, probably the best ones to use. If you're in Lancashire there's a sort of the Lancashire and Cheshire Fauna Society produced this book in 2015 the Dragonflies of Lancashire North Merseyside which is I think now available to download from the Tinipsha Project website. There is a book on Cheshire Dragonflies but that was published in 1989 so it's particularly well out of date and I'm not sure if it's available anywhere at the moment. So as you're actually going out and about there, we obviously need you to send the records in of what you've seen. You can either send them to the usual sources like iRecord or your local record centre. Or if you want to, you can send them to your local dragonfly recorder. In Lancashire, that's Steve White. And in Cheshire, we've got Chris Meredith and John Roberts. But basically, yeah, the idea is to send them to the British Dragonfly Society so they can sort of, sort of manage the records and they produce a regular Dragonfly Atlas, which sort of gives out, you know, gives you the information about distribution of these species. So any records are useful, even the really common species, because dragonflies, like a lot of insects, that do react quite rapidly to environmental change. And particularly with the warming climate, we do find that sort of a lot of dragonflies are extending the range at the moment. Although, unfortunately, there are one or two which are sort of going in the opposite direction. There's useful links on the website you can look at. The British Dragonfly Society is a national charity which sort of spon you know, sponsors dragonfly studies throughout the UK. Cheshire Dragonflies has a blog which is regularly maintained by the county recorders. There is an old Cheshire Dragonflies website which was active up to about 2017. It's still worth looking at because it gives you information on a monthly basis of what, what's been seen where and there's some useful, some useful images on there which you can use as, to ID what you've seen. And as far as Lancashire is concerned, there's a Lancashire Dragonfly Group Facebook page which often sort of has images of posted of what's been seen and where. So there's lots of things out there you can look, look use to sort of identify what you're looking for. Or failing that, you can just email us at the Tinipsa project and we'll sort of try and help out. 
I said, a lot of dragonflies you can identify from a decent photograph. So just as a bit of fun, we'll sort of have a little bit of a quiz. Just sort of enter what you think it's likely to be. If you type it in a sort of chat at the, at the bottom, then we'll sort of see what people come up with. Can anybody, have we got sort of any ideas as to what that might be? Well, if you look at it, it's a sort of small, smallish dragonfly. It's got a cylindrical abdomen, so that sort of means it's one of the darter species. The, the, the legs are sort of all dark. There's no obvious stripe down the middle, and it's got two sort of dark spots on the tip of the abdomen and the weight it's slightly wasted here so this is actually a female ruddy darter okay we got um there's quite a few people got that got that right so, and some are saying common data as well so, yeah um, but yeah ruddy data look, look look for the wasted abdomen and the sort of dark marks at the tip that's sort all of characteristic of that species We have any sort of yeah, it's obviously from the, the apparent size and the way it's perched. It's a, one of the hawker dragonflies. What to look for on this is the inverted triangle on the second segment and the sort of blue mark, blue spots down the sort of abdomen. So this is a, this is a migrant hawker male. Okay, well, 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 everyone's everyone's got that one. Uh, someone corrected theirs too, but uh, yeah, every, everyone's got that one. I was just commented. That one's pretty straightforward. <laughs> if anybody gets that wrong, yes, if you can't put male large red damselfly. So if you, if you were in, in, in Kent then, then Tony, could you confuse this? There is the small red damselfly, which small is red. a brighter red and sort of, as its name suggests, quite a lot smaller. And that has red legs. And is it, and is it coming north? Uh, not I'm aware of, it's mainly a southern species. It's another sort of relatively straightforward one. Hopefully you've all said it's a male emerald damselfly. No, it's typical with the way it's holding its wings, the colour of the abdomen and the sort of blue tip, blue markings on the tip and on the thorax. Yeah, everyone, everyone's been saying emerald. That's a bit more tricky. If you look at it, it's got the broad blue stripes on the thorax. Segment two has a lot, looks like a sort of round ball on a stalk, and it's got the sort of all blue tip to the abdomen. And there's no obvious sign of the Synagrian spur. So that's a common blue damselfly male. Yeah, all, all those answers are correct. Doing very well. So 
Another darter dragonfly, sort of yellow, yellowish abdomen, not wasted, brown mm -hmm. on the thorax. This is the female common darter. Female common darter. Oh yes. Well, we had th we had three different answers <laughs> going on there, but yeah. Yes. Most most of you got that one. Yeah, I think if you had this idea of the size, it'd probably be a lot more easy. I suspect most people have ruddy or black data, have they? Had a broad body chaser and four spot chaser. Ah. Yes, that's. This one's pretty obvious. Got big, big red eyes, so it's a red-eyed damselfly. I think it's got the sort of black top to the thorax and black top to the abdomen and the blue tip to the tail. The small red-eyed damselfly is very similar, but has a lot more blue on the underside of segment eight, and obviously it's a lot smaller. And also, if you look at the side of the thorax it has this spur marking a plus a dot about there so that's what you're looking for and when it's at rest it tends to have the tip of its abdomen pointing slightly upwards so that's what you're looking for if you're looking for small red damselflies small red eyed damselfly i say most of the time you're not likely to come across that This one's obviously another hawker dragonfly. It's got paired spots on the abdomen, which is of, in this case, is all pale green. There's no obvious stripes at the tip of the abdomen, and it's got this obvious yellow orange marking along the front of the wings. So this is a female common hawker. Almost unanimous there in, in the answers. What we like to see. So it's we had a brown hawker as well. How is it different from a brown hawker, Tony? Well, the brown hawker has an obviously brown suffusion to the wings, and the markings are a lot less obvious on the on the abdomen. This is another sort of medium-sized dragonfly. This is the female of the black-tailed skimmer. You see it's got the yellowish abdomen with this sort of ladder pattern of markings. Yeah, well, unanimous on that one. Sounds good to me. And the last one. Another large hawker dragonfly. This one, you'll note, has two complete blue stripes at the tip of the abdomen, paired pale green spots, a slight waist just after the thorax, and these two large yellow spots behind the head. This is a male southern hawker. Yeah, unanimous on that one as well. Yeah. And that's your lot. So if anybody's got any, hopefully Phil have got some questions. And so. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, that was excellent. And uh, I, I enjoyed the quiz as well. It was, it, was, it was good to see so many people, well, almost everyone sort of getting them very, very quickly who, who was answering them. So yeah, that's great. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through to questions um and we'll we'll sort of take questions from the chat um but also people are putting their hands up um they can do it with either, either the sort of the reactions button or or physically if, if you've got your video on obviously we can see you 
A question from, from Natalie um, Kofi, who says, have you found that dragonflies and damselflies are emerging earlier as well as changing their range? Yes, they are. This year in particular, a lot of the large red damselflies were emerging several days earlier than they were in previous years. So obviously that weather sort of, the warm weather had anything to do with it, but it does seem to be a trend which we are noticing in recent years, yes. Okay. Um, and a question um, from Jane and Andrew. Um, a lot of butterflies and moths are in serious decline. How are damselflies and dragonflies faring? On the whole, they're doing quite well. Obviously, they are benefiting from sort of lots of habitat creation and management, which is useful for dragonflies. So obviously, you know, for the vast majority of species are either sort of, the population's either stable or increasing. So obviously, there are a few which we're not sure about, which, which were rare anyway. So it's possible that sort of they might be going to decline over the next few years. But given the fact that we've got several new species coming into the country in the last few years anyway. And that variable is, is one that's declined nationally, isn't it? That we only have at Hatchmere. Yes, it seems to be the ones which are quite fussy in their habitat requirements, which is sort of suffering the most. Um, okay, thank you. I'll, okay, we'll go to um, Keir now. So, Keir, I'll just um, unmute you, if that's okay. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot how to do the uh, the chat. I was just going to very quickly ask, um, with the dragonflies obviously changing ranges, what do you think will be the kind of the the new migrants to the local area, if any, in the kind of coming years? I think anything's getting closer and closer to getting into the Cheshire Lancashire area. It's possible that some of the sort of rarer dull, obviously we've got the sort of small red red eyed damselfly is one. The white leg damselfly has a, started to appear in sort of parts of the River Dee south of Chester. I said the scarce blue tail is in East Cheshire now. It's possible that the keel skimmer is probably the next one. That has, seems to be being seen in more in sort of regular you know, most years at the moment. Okay, was, did you have any? Was it was that okay, Keir, or did you did you, was there any follow up to that? Well, yeah, it's, it's because I thought I uh, saw a keeled skimmer the other day, so I was wondering if they were going to be about. Yes, uh, they are sort of being increasingly sort of recorded. Whether or yeah. not it's more people actually going out there looking, we can't really tell at the moment. But yeah, it was near the River Alt. So. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kia. Um, okay, so our question from Julie. Um, with some species species extending their range into our area, which species do we think are going the other way and are being lost from our area? The obvious one was the golden ringed damsel dragonfly, which is a large hawker dragonfly which used to be found sort of in the forest of Boland and North Lancashire. The records for that seem to be declining in recent years. So that's the obvious one that seems to be sort of you know, potentially going extinct in this area. Where where is a good place in in, in the northwest to see Gordon well, Ring? It's in this area from it's the Forest of Boland, that sort of area. It's mainly a sort of upland species. So North Wales is a good place, any or Cumbria. Yeah, I, I used to see a, a lot of them in the Lake District. Uh, they're, they're, yeah, wonderful species. Um, okay, next question. I'm just going to have a look if anyone's got their hand up. No, I don't think so. So we'll go to, back to the chat. Um, this is from Sky.Raven. I have put in a small pond made from a washing bowl. Uh, would dragonflies use it? And if so, how can I attract them with plants, etc.? It's presumably yeah. something that you've done in your garden. I think dragonflies tend to find these things for themselves. I've not actually 
come across any sort of literature saying that you have to plant certain plants for dragonflies. Basically, it's obviously if it's enough sort of food items in the pond for them. I mean, it's no use a dragonfly laying its eggs in a pond and then the larvae finding there's nothing to eat when it sort of emerges. So it's having a good invertebrate population in your pond, which is more likely to attract breeding dragonflies than natural, the actual flowers or plants around it. Okay. I guess some vegetation will, will attract invertebrates as well, though. I, I'm sure it will be a, a, a good, a positive thing to be to do to put sort of uh, native uh, water vegetation in there. Um, the question from Stella on the chat, can a roosting post or particular types of aquatic vegetation help attract dragonflies or damselflies? Not that I've come across, no. It's sort of, they tend to sort of, the territorial males will tend to sort of pick their own bit of random bit of vegetation and they'll just sort of use that as a perch. So there's no obviously sort of, they don't seem to have any sort of favoured perching sites that I've come across. Okay, and then, um, well, Pauline's just commenting that uh, she's had a golden ringed in mould in North Wales, so that perhaps that's a bit closer for, for some people than um, the forest of Boland. Um, okay, another another question from Kia. Um, what dragonfly or damselfly do you get most excited to see? I think my favourite's the southern hawker, because that's probably the sort of watching one of those was probably the first time I really got interested in sort of observing dragonflies. The fact it's sort of one you can actually, and it's one you don't have to travel far to see either. You can just sort of go to your nearest pond or canal and hope sort of we see one. It's not one you sort of have to go far. And they do go in your garden ponds, don't they, Southern Hawkers? They do. That's probably the only hawker that you will get in a sort of small pond. We'll go back to questions. We've got more questions on the on the chat now. Um, What's a good site for small red-eyed? There are several sites in Cheshire around sort of the Vale Royal Northwich area. And there's a place down in Sandbach called Warmingham Flash. They have a site to know of in Cheshire. But I think, isn't it been recorded at the Old Garden Festival site in South Liverpool? Oh, right, okay. I think it's one that's been recorded in there. I'm not yeah and then these well the, the festival site was obviously ex I, I know that's you, you know anyone can go there but at the other sites you mentioned in cheshire are they can can you just sort of turn up there I'm not they going. are sort of open sites yeah okay well hopefully you're not uh in in north lancashire then whoever's <laughs> i think they might be a site in burnley as well where it's oh, okay Um, so this is from Charlotte to the next question. Can you tell me what to look for on large red damselfly between male and female? How do you tell sexes apart? Well, the normal, the commonest variety of female has a sort of blue and yellow and black and yellow markings along the thorax, which is sort of can be quite distinctive. But as I say, there's three different colour forms of the female red, large red. But mainly, if you're mainly sort of it's the thorax and head are, red, are sort of red, the legs are black, and then the, thor the abdomen does vary. But it's usually sort of reddish underneath and blackish to some extent on top. So if you've got a male, it's all sort of bright red, more or less, down to the tip. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, we just have some comments, really, in, in the chat now. 
Um, David Pollard is saying that the mosses of South Cumbria are very good for black data. Yes, so are the ones in South Lancashire. Um, I th so I can't I can't see any other questions or or hands raised. Um, oh, this is from Rob's iPad. Any good sites for vagrant dragonflies in Cheshire and Lancashire? Most of the vagrant dragonflies I tend to hear about seem to turn up on the coast. So you're looking at along the Sefton coast or up perhaps towards Heesham, that sort of area. They seem to be the sort of ones that produce most of the sort of vagrants in this area. And, and, and most recently, is it to the hairy hawker that was turned up at Lunt Meadows? Is that, is, is that right? Is that gone now? I'm not sure whether it's still there or not, but. I think there's two. I think there's another one found somewhere else in North Lancashire as well. But they tend not to be a sort of vagrant dragonfly. They're more of a resident, which is sort of slightly expanding its range. Of, it's not really known as a migrant. Okay, and um, and then Rod was saying, did anyone mention red eye on the Leeds, Liverpool? At Liverpool End. Oh, I'm not sure quite what you mean there, Rod. On the canal, the Leeds Liverpool Canal at the Liverpool End. So, so maybe red eyed occurs there as well, and maybe that's a site where you can go to see it. Yeah, just look for any site with lots of floating water lily leaves. And then, and then Dave is saying that red, again with red-eyed damselflies seen on the canal near Aintree, also on the canal at Pennington Flash. So lot seems like quite a, a few opportunities to, to see that yeah. one. Um, okay. Uh, Right, no more, no more questions that I can see then. Um, so yeah, as I think, as 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 Stella put, um, you know, now's have a go. Uh, if if you if you're not already, uh, some of you seem to be already quite ex experienced with, with even knowing sites for certain dragonflies and damselflies. But um, um, yeah, you know, just. I would particularly recommend those um, short-range Pentax binoculars um, to for seeing, you know, seeing right into the middle of, of larger ponds. Um, and it's a shame because we invested in, in a number of those for for the workshop um, that, we, that we obviously can't have, can't use now. Um, but we will we'll we'll have we'll have the two-day workshop again um, next year if if Tony is. Is willing to, to run it so um, and assuming there's no there's no pandemics going on um, and we, yeah then we hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll see some of you there as well but in the meantime as I said a Ricks and Clay Pits is a really good site but I'm sure there are many others um, in, in the region that you can go and practice your dragonfly ID um, so need some nice warm sunny weather <laughs> yeah we need some it's not looking uh, great out there this afternoon, but um, uh, from where I am. Um, but hopefully, yeah, I think it's supposed to get better next week, isn't it? So, and warmer anyway. Um, so I'll um, hopefully see um, see you again at our other webinars throughout the summer, and even hopefully in the field if we're able to get some recording days underway. So thank you very much. For this afternoon's session and and all your contributions as well and and tips on different sites uh oh lily pads at burton mere wetlands for red eye as, as another yeah, one seen them there. so so yeah you go there's lots of great tips in in the chat there um 
but um, yeah, that that's it. So um, thank you very much, and and we'll we'll see you again soon, and have a lovely afternoon.